My guest today is Barry Miller, the Chief Executive Officer of Aries Private Markets Fund and partner in the Aries PE Secondaries Group. With approximately $25 billion in assets under management, Aries Secondaries Group is a pioneer with over three decades of experience delivering data-driven results across a range of alternative asset classes. Uh, with that, Barry, thank you so much for joining us today here in the studio. Great. Thank you for having me. It is great to have you, and I'm really thrilled to have a conversation about the private equity secondaries market. I know you've been doing this for over 25 years, and it's definitely been a growth space within the industry. So just help us level set, you know, where are we in the private equity secondaries environment today? It looks like last year the transaction volumes did perk up, we're up about 4%. So where are we? What's your big picture view for 2024? So I think as we look at 2024, 2025 and beyond, within transaction volume, we need to look a little bit in the rearview mirror. So as we look at, yes, transaction volume definitely picked up this year. Mm -hmm. uh, previous year, we did roughly 115 billion, year before about 130. But as we look over the last 15 years, what's interesting about secondary volume is that every five years, transaction volume has doubled. So as we project that out over the next three or four years, we believe we should be able to get north of 200 billion. Mm -hmm. In addition to that is that that split. So the transaction volume is between the LP led side and the GP led side over the past few years, it's been split roughly 50 50. But as you go back over the last three or four years, or even a little bit longer, what you'll see is the current GP led volume is greater than overall transaction volume has been. So mm -hmm. we've seen a real spike up in GP led volume, we've seen a real spike up in overall LP volume. And as we think about it going forward, we feel highly confident that we should continue to see growth. Right, so there's the GP-led side and the LP-led side. Let's dig a little bit deeper into each one of them. So as a private investor, why do I want to give the GP more time to, um, you know, to execute you know, on a turnaround plan or whatever it may be that they have not been able to accomplish while they were holding the company in their fund? So I think as you look at it with the GP-led, there's really three areas of focus. So the first is the, exactly as you said, the duration of the company doesn't match the duration of where it sits in the life of the fund. It just needs more time. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece is, is that they're looking to do some sort of transformational acquisition and they need a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. And then the third is that high class problem or a high class challenge is that they need to get some money back to their investors. But overall, when you look at it, you wouldn't do a GP led deal with an underperforming company. You do a GP led with a star asset. So an mm -hmm. asset that is generally given existing investors somewhere north of a two, two and a half times multiple. You want to focus on a company that's doing well, that's performing well, and just needs one of those kind of two or three attributes. Yeah, more time, more money. And then all the LP side, you know, we had this notion of the denominator effect back in 2022, where the private equity assets held really well, the public markets have really suffered. So as a result, you were a little bit off size and you had to trim back your private equity allocations. And that's what led to the volume of uh, PE second injuries, but fast forward to 2023 and you don't have the same uh, denominator effect and going into 2024. So what's driving the LP transaction volumes? So LPs today are seeking liquidity. The DPI or the dollars paid in as investors look at their individual portfolios, there's just not enough money coming back in these portfolios. Hmm. So how do you create liquidity? You can enter the second. Because there are no exits. Correct. We'll say that there are fewer exits than they had anticipated. Right. And so as you look at it today, they're looking for liquidity. So investors may sell their entire portfolio. They may sell a portion of their portfolio. How are they going to generate liquidity? I think the second piece here is that for large investors in the asset class, there's been a fundamental shift in how they invest. So it used to be you built a large diversified portfolio, your returns migrated to the mean, and the mean was okay. It's, a, it's a, been a strong performing asset yeah. class. The other piece here is that the largest investors in our asset class are public pension plans. Mm -hmm. Think about them as battleships, these massive machines. They don't turn on a dime. Right. And so the first thing they need to do is build out their rebalancing range, and then over time they will enter the secondary market as a seller. And we're consistently seeing large plans enter, but they're not selling individual funds. They're selling relationships. So I'm not going to be with Fund X anymore. I'm going to go to Fund Y, but I'm going to sell all five funds. And then they say, well, I'm now going to commit more money to the next group. So when you put it all together, there's both secular and cyclical tailwinds behind us that would suggest that the market should continue to grow and be robust. So I think as you look at some of the large public pension plans, while some may be more funded, they have been historically. In general, when you look at them, they remain still underfunded. When you look at some of the large 
non-US investors are continuing to deploy significant amounts of dollars in the asset class. But the one area that is the most underpenetrated within the asset class is the wealth channel, the high net worth, yeah. the ultra high net worth, the mass affluent. And that's where we're seeing a pretty significant pickup from a deployment standpoint. And as that continues to grow, our transaction volume is right. in the industry that's will grow. Right, that's the additional source of dry powder and future capital. And of course, we know the numbers. If there's $135 trillion of you know assets for institutions, that's actually pretty well matched with what's out there in terms of private wealth. And the penetration rate, of course, is not 30 or 40, but closer to probably 2 to 5%. And you mentioned returns, so let's talk about returns and how do you drive returns. Uh, returns for uh, private equity secondaries have been quite strong over the last number of years, uh, double-digit returns. So how do you create value as a secondary manager in the space? We create value three ways. So we look to buy assets at a discount or a discount to NAV, a discount to intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. We look to buy assets that are growing. And then the third way is financial engineering. So being able to use a little bit of leverage, although today with where rates are is a little bit more difficult. And then we use portfolio management. That's the wrapper. The other factor to success in uh, secondaries, I assume, is your ability to source deals. So what's the secret sauce for you, for Aries, in sourcing those? Our secondary business really is in the center of everything that Aries does. So we have a large direct lending platform. And we believe we're the largest non-bank lender globally, covering 900 sponsors, seeing 3,000 companies a year. So a great sourcing funnel for us. We have a direct private equity business. Think about that more of industry and domain expertise. So if we found a great company, a great group of companies, understanding the industry we think is important. We need to make sure we finance it correctly. So we have our alternative credit business as we think about financing many of our peers. And then we have a group of global client solutions, high net worth distribution, where effectively are just blanketing the world. Mm -hmm. So as we think about it, whether it's sourcing from the investment team, whether it's sourcing it from global client solutions, from the institutional or the wealth side, we feel we've, we've got it covered. Right. Well, speaking of blanketing the world, I know you're going to be everywhere between Dubai and Arizona. So, uh, so Barry, it's a, it's a great perspective. And just the last question that I have for you, how does a private wealth client uh, access this? How available is this asset class to us? That is a great question as we look at today because that, that answer has shifted so much over the last five to 10 years. So as we look at it today, there's been this democratization of, of private markets. Uh, two years ago, we launched the Aries Private Markets Fund, mm -hmm. which was to bring institutional private equity to the mass affluent, the high net worth, and the ultra high net worth, effectively bringing that 30-year history we have in institutional private equity. And so now we're able to deliver it. We're delivering it in a product that is focused on secondaries, predominantly private equity secondaries, focused on buyout, focused on North America. So as we look at the market today, I think part of it was, it's not that there wasn't an appetite for it, there wasn't the appropriate products. And now we as an industry, we have been able to deliver this democratization. That's the word that people talk about. This democratization, being able to bring these same products that are in line, have similar return profiles, have similar assets. And I think today we've also lowered the, the minimums for people to come in. Well, we've certainly come a long way as an industry in terms of product innovation and really making this institutional asset class that it used to be uh, much more accessible to the private wealth client. Uh, so Barry, thank you so much for sharing uh, your perspective with us on private equity secondaries. And obviously this is a growing asset class. And what I really liked about our discussion is that it's not that institutional investors don't want to be in private equity, it's just that have compelling reasons to lighten up. But that's what gives us an opportunity as an investor to step in, buy some of these potentially great companies at a discount and continue to mitigate the J curve and creating value. So uh, Barry, thank you so much for shedding light on that for us. Great, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you.